Hi, everyone. Welcome back. Um, we're doing another pre recorded lecture today just because the cycads we cover quite a bit of material. So I want you to have the ability to pause and take a break as we work through it. So let me share my screen. Okay, great. Uh, so you should let me just make sure that I'm sharing the right thing. Which is this. Okay. And I'll move this to the side here. Okay, great. Uh, I know I'm meeting with some of you today for office hours. Um, if I wasn't able to accommodate you for office hours today, um, I would have sent you an email giving other times that I'm available to meet outside of office hours. And if anyone still, if anyone wants to meet in office hours and you haven't reached out to me yet, uh, please do so in a respectful professional way, please. I've been getting some uh, emails that have been less than that. All right, so let's move on to the, the cycads, right? So we're in the seed plants now. And today we're gonna talk about the phylum cycadophyta. Last time we learned about seed plants, a little bit more about the seed plants and about the amazing ovule. And then today we're gonna to begin talking about specific seed plants and that we're gonna talk about a gymnosperm known as cycads. So I always like to get oriented of where we are. We are well up into the vascular plants. We're now in the seed plants and we're in these gymnosperms. Today we'll talk about cycads, next time talk about ginkgo, and then following that conifers. So cycads are in the phylum cycadophyta. That's how you say that, cycadophyta. Um, so it's nice that the thing of the phylum is cycad, right? <laughs> like cycadophyta. So you just put cycad and then ophyta at the end, right? Which is handy. Uh, even though they kind of look like a palm tree, right? I get it. Kind of looks like a palm tree. But they are not palm trees. They, um, the word cycad actually comes from the Greek word, which means palm, because whoever first described it thought it looked like a palm, but it's not. Palms came millions and millions of years later uh, for what it's worth. They're also named for this large genus, Cycus. But yes, if I ask you if a cycad is a palm, it is not a palm. There's not that many species of cycads left, only about 300 of them. Many of those are facing extinction for different reasons, including they have slow reproduction, um, their seeds are eaten and uh, destroyed in the process, and uh, it, which is a weird thing. Usually that's not the case. Um, they're losing their habitat. So where cycads like to grow is getting built up or turned into some other purpose like agriculture. And sometimes governments straight up just remove cycads because if uh, certain animals eat the, um, the seeds or parts of the plant rather, the leaves and stuff, it could um, poison them. All right. So I, I love this old, this is an old draw, drawing, right? Of like, 275 million years ago, right? <laughs> the Permian geological period, right? It's like, yeah. Um, so that's when this cycad showed up. You could see in this drawing uh, in the front here, I use, um, I'll use white. Uh, so like this here is a cycad, this here is a cycad, um, right? This little guy over here is a cycad. So anyways, yes, they showed up around um, 275 million years ago in the Permian, but they were, they experienced a lot of diversification during the Jurassic period. And so probably when you hear the word Jurassic, you probably think dinosaurs and you would be right. And also cycads are plants, the dinosaurs ate, um, which I, I love these old, like this is one of my favorite. Uh, slides of the whole semester is like this old <laughs> this guy eating the cycad. Um, 
Yeah. So Dr. Casper always used to make, he used to teach the class before I did, before he retired. And uh, he always made such a big deal about like psychads are plants, the dinosaurs ate. And so I like to keep that going. Um, yeah. These pictures I think actually came from him. <laughs> Anyways, um, it's kind of cool that there's still plants like on earth right now that you can go look at and even buy for a house plant and know that like one of its ancestors might have been eaten by a dinosaur. It's kind of cool. Yes. All right. So where do psychads live today? Right today. And this was like hundreds of millions of years ago. Uh, where do psychads live today? And so most of the time they're growing in the tropics or the subtropical regions. So in this map here, all the pink areas are showing you where psychads occur now in modern time. Majority of it is um, occurs naturally outside of the US. There are some that occur, or one species rather, that occurs in Florida. But you can buy cycads as a landscape plant or as a house plant. So if you go to more Southern climates, like in the South of the USA, or even um, if you go to California, that kind of environment, you can actually grow cycads or, or even probably Arizona or other places where it stays warm most of the time. Um, you can grow cycads as a landscape plant as shown here. Remember, these are not palms. Um, so very, very important as a landscape plant and a house plant. And if you have a cycad as a house plant and not doing well, uh, send me a picture, reach out to me and I can help you troubleshoot it. Okay, so we are in the vascular plants. We're in the feed plants, but we're in the vascular plants. So we know that the sporophyte generation is dominant and we know the sporophyte generation is vascular and has true root stems and leaves, right? We know that already. Cycads grow in two different types of form depending on the species. So remember this word habit, habit um, means form or shape, right? Form. And so cycads can grow in a columnar habit uh, where the, the trunk of the tree is like long and kind of skinny or cycads can grow in what's called a bulbous habit and that it's the trunk is kind of round and short. Uh, and the columnar habit over here is thought to be the more primitive form, meaning occurred before the bulbous habit occurred in terms of evolutionary time. Okay. We're gonna talk a little bit about parts of the sporophyte generation of cycads. So there's gonna be some terminology here that's uh, familiar because we covered it during the fern lab. So this is a cycad, uh, this cycad to just kind of add to what we just learned, what kind of habit does this cycad have? Does this cycad have a columnar habit with a long skinny trunk or does this cycad have a short round trunk? short round, right? So this is a bulbous habit cycad. Um, emerging from the trunk, which is this, you see the leaves and the leaves have these terms that we've already covered before. The blade or the lamina, same thing, either one is fine, which is the, the green, the, the major part of the leaf, right? The green, sometimes if you think of a green leaf, you think the green flat part, right? But Cycads have compound leaves like ferns, so it's not green and flat. It's like all these little things here, but this is the blade or the lamina. Then you have the rachis. I will use a different color, pink. The rachis, which is something we covered already in ferns, which is the part of the stem that goes all the way through the lamina. And then the petiole, which is the part of the stem that's below the lamina, uh, below the the blade, right? So like on this on this leaf on here on the side, this big part here is the blade or the lamina. The part of the stem that's going in the blade or the lamina is the rachis. And then the part of the stem, whoops, below the blade or the lamina is the petiole. Terms we've already covered in the ferns. Just like ferns, um, 
cycads have megaphils. So all the plants that we're going to cover going forward, uh, all the plants that we're going to cover going forward have some things in common. They have megaphils because only Lycopodium and Selaginella had microphils. Everything else has megaphils. So that might be a, a handy way to organize that is to just remember what doesn't have them. Um, yeah, so, so cycads also, and there's other things that, the, that all plants have too. Um, we don't need to, we're gonna cover enough today. I don't need to list them all out right now. Um, but yeah, cycads have megaphils just like the ferns did. And you can see here, I already told you on the previous slide that cycads have a compound leaf, right? But here's a bunch of different cycad leaves. And so some of them may not be easy to tell, like here might be kind of blurry, not able to tell. But if we were taking this leaf, for example, what is the leaf shape, right? So in the fern lab, we learned about different ways to describe leaves, um, simple versus compound. If you have a compound leaf, you have palmately compound and other types, what other type, right? One that looks like a feather, maybe that rings a bell. Uh, yeah, so if that doesn't seem familiar to you, go back to the fern lecture where we covered the shape of leaves, particularly compound leaves a lot. Cycads tend to have a one times pinnately compound leaf. So again, if this sounds confusing, go back to the firm lecture. Okay, here we go. That's like, if I were to take that leaf that I circled before and held it up more closely, you can see that it's one times pinnately compound. So um, how do we know it's one times pinnately compound? Well, this whole thing is a single leaf and it has leaflets or as we learned, pinna, right? It only has one level of division, right? It doesn't look like, for example, this, oops, right? The leaflets don't look like this, right? The leaflets look like this, right? One solid thing. So one times pinnately compound, um, just to kind of keep these terms going. So this whole green section here is the blade or the lamina. The rachis would be this, oops. Uh-oh, sorry about that. The rachis would be this whole stem part that's in the inside of the blade or the lamina and the petiole on this leaf is just this little thing at the bottom. This is how we build our understanding of these terms. Okay. So when you're looking at the slides later, um, it will help remind you what I just said right now. What else? Okay, um, cycads really don't branch that much. Usually it's just a one solid thing. Uh, however, sometimes on these really older cycads, you might have these branches, but to be fair, they don't really look like branches like this doesn't really look like a branch to me but um like this doesn't really look like a branch to me but technically they are branches but branching doesn't happen that often so if for example if you were going to buy a cycad for your uh, landscape plant and you wanted something that kind of spread out and branched and created a lot of shade cycad probably wouldn't be a good choice for you because they don't typically branch. Um, cycads, oh, this is something that's cool. So cycads, this, is this a new term for us? I'm not sure. Cycads have leaves that are called evergreen. Evergreen meaning they don't fall off each year. Oh yeah, we covered this when we talked about the phenology assignment. That's right. Um, yeah, leaves that are evergreen don't fall off every year. So like when fall comes or autumn comes, and all the leaves fall off the trees, those trees where leaves fall off every year are, if the leaves fall off every year, we call that deciduous, right? So cycads are not deciduous, not deciduous. <clears throat> the leaves are evergreen and stay on all the time. If you look at this drawing on the, or this picture on the right, so each of these, like this is one cycad, this is one cycad, um, just for scale, those cycads are probably about five feet tall, give or take. 
Uh, and you might notice, so like the green leaves are all at the top. Those are the living leaves. Over time though, they don't lose their leaves every year, but eventually leaves get too old to just keep going. And the cycad is also growing taller. So the older leaves that are closer to the base of the plant will, will eventually die as the new leaves show up. Usually they don't actually fall off though. Usually they stay kind of attached to the trunk. Um, but if they do get removed, the bases of those leaves, which are shown here. So like here, maybe white's not a good choice here. I'll use red. So like you see here, here's a leaf, right? Here's a leaf, here's a leaf, etc. The petiole of those leaves, after that leaf dies, will remain kind of, part of the petiole will remain attached to the trunk of the tree and cause call and create basically kind of like an armor. So like on this here, this is the remains of a petiole. This is the remains of a petiole. This is the remains of a petiole. This would have been originally like a leaf would have come out of that right here. It's like had leaf coming out, right? It's like had leaf coming out here. Uh, yeah, so that's, that's just what this slide's saying. Okay. Roots are a tap root system. We'll learn more about root systems as we go further into the plants, or further into the gymnosperms rather. But tap root system just means that the root grows kind of looking like a carrot. So a carrot is also an example of a tap root. Tap root system just means it like grows basically just straight down and doesn't really branch out at all like a carrot, right? Kind of look, this kind of looks like a carrot, right? Like a brown carrot. Um, so roots are a taproot system. Sometimes certain species have a weird type of root, a really weird type of root um, that's called, and don't get scared, we're gonna go through this word on the next slide, but apogeotropic, or you might see the word uh, coralloid. They mean the same thing, but sometimes they have these weird, apogeotropic roots um, that actually grow out of the soil rather than into the soil, which is weird. Why would something do that? <laughs> um, so I, you can say apogeotropic or you can say coralloid. I like apogeotropic because the name apogeotropic tells you what it does, which is grow out of the soil, right? As it says here. So what does apogeotropic mean? Apo comes from the Greek apo, which means away from. Geo comes from the Greek uh, g, which means earth. And tropism refers to the Latin tropus, which means to turn. So if you were to break down the word apogeotropic, you could say they, so if you have apogeotropic roots, you have roots that turn away from the earth, apogeotropic, right? Or roots that turn away from the earth, meaning grow out of the soil, up, right? Turn away from the earth, earth is below us, right? <laughs> so up, out of the soil. All right, why would it do that? That's weird, What's you would, you would think roots are supposed to go in the soil, right? <laughs> like to get water and to anchor the plant. So what is this function of this weird apogeotropic root? Um, well, first of all, if you, if you never knew that cycads did this and you had a cycad that was growing and you saw this stuff, let me see, uh, I guess, bright blue, and you saw all this stuff growing out from the base of your cycad, you would probably think your cycad is sick, right? That doesn't look like something you normally see growing out from under, under a plant. But no, it's not sick. Those are instead these apogeotropic roots. Um, from far away, they almost kind of look like peanuts. That's kind of how I think of them, that grow from the base out of the soil. And so the reason that they grow outside of the soil is because they, over evolutionary time, these roots have evolved 
a symbiotic relationship with cyanobacteria. And most likely, I think probably what happened is that back in evolutionary time, you know, 175 million years ago, it could be that maybe they lived in environments where the uh, the the um, ground that they were in would get flooded and like it would be hard for the roots to get oxygen if they're underwater. So that might have been one reason why these roots came about to grow above the soil. But anyways, they have these special roots have a special symbiotic relationship with cyanobacteria, which is something we've seen in other plants, right? Maybe one thing you should do maybe is to make a list of all the things that have had a symbiotic relationship so far. There hasn't been that many. Um, hornwort was one, right? Had a symbiotic relationship. And in this symbiotic relationship, the advantage for the cyanobacteria, well, the advantage for the root is that, so I'm gonna just use, I'll use blue because cyanobacteria is blue. Um, well, well, this on the left is not, so this on the left is the peanut thing, right? This is the apogeotropic root, this here on the left. If we did a cross section through part of that root, which is what this is showing you here, you would see this blue layer inside of the apogeotropic root. And now this is why I'm using blue, this blue layer inside of these apogeotropic roots. And that blue layer is the cyanobacteria. And what they do for the plant is the cyanobacteria is able to fix nitrogen, just like before when we've seen symbiotic relationships with cyanobacteria or other types of um, photosynthetic bacteria, right? Usually their role for the plant is to fix nitrogen. And in return, the cyanobacteria gets to live inside of the plant root. And so therefore it gets a nice little moist home for it to live in. Uh, on the right here is a microscope slide showing you the cross section through an apogeotropic root. And you see here, the cross section of the, here it says coralloid, but apogeotropic, coralloid, same thing, showing cyanobacterial zone CZ. So here, it's this whole thing is that thing, whoops, that I showed you here, right? That cyanobacterial zone. Cool. All right, so now we're gonna talk a little bit about growth because we have to. <laughs> it's important for us to learn um, some, some terms and distinguish between primary growth and secondary growth as we move through the gymnosperms because it's going to become more important in, for example, ginkgo and the conifers. So before we learn new stuff, let's kind of do a recall from stuff we've already covered in the course. So we did cover this idea of growth by the apical meristem, especially in those earlier um, things, right? So this slide says primary growth is by the apical meristem, right? Apical meristem. And that apical meristem, remember, when I first talked about meristems, I was telling you like stem cells, right? Like, so the cells that make up the apical meristem can divide via mitosis and create different types of cells depending on what's needed. So maybe stem, um, no, that's a, that's a little, maybe leaf cells, right? <laughs> um, maybe root cells. Um, maybe xylem, maybe phloem, all the different cells that are needed. So the apical meristem uh, is going to give rise to tissues that give rise to these different, sorry, the apical meristem is going to give rise to primary meristems that are going to give rise to primary tissue. So apical meristem makes primary meristems. Primary meristems make primary tissues. It's all well and good to say it in words, but let's make a little schematic here, right? So here you go. On the left, you have that apical meristem. The apical meristem gives rise to the primary meristems. Here they are. We have covered them to some extent before in lecture four, protoderm, ground meristem, and procambium. These are terms that we saw before. 
So if they seem unfamiliar to you, go back to, I think it's lecture four. So apical meristem makes primary meristems. Here they are. And the primary meristems are each going to make different types of primary tissue. So the protoderm is going to make epidermis. The ground meristem is going to make the parts of the stem or root or mesophyll of the leaf that makes up the kind of supporting structure. And so there's a lot of different tissues that are involved in that. And then the procambium is going to make the primary xylem and primary phloem. So apical meristem makes primary meristems and each primary meristem makes a type of primary tissue, right? Because plants grow. <laughs> plants grow, so they need to make new cells and tissues as they do that, just like we do. Okay, this is what, oh, it was lecture four. So here's what I'm saying. This is something that we did cover to some extent in lecture four. And basically, this is exactly the same slide we saw in lecture, lecture four. So here, primary tissues of sporophyte, I pick a different color, purple. And let me move my head here because I can't see. So in, so in the leaf, in the stem, in the root, you're going to have these primary tissues. You're gonna have dermal tissue in the leaf, in the stem, and in the root. You're gonna have vascular tissue in the leaf, in the stem, and in the root. And you're gonna have ground tissue in the leaf, in the stem, and in the root. And we did talk about this, but I'll just go through it briefly. So the dermal tissue in the leaf is the epidermis, right? The dermal tissue in the stem is the epidermis. And the dermal tissue in the root is you guessed it, the epidermis, right? Dermal tissue. These are primary tissues, mind you, primary tissues. Vascular tissue, xylem and phloem. In a leaf, the xylem and phloem is in veins, right? In a stem, xylem and phloem are in the steel, right? And in the root, the xylem and phloem is also still in the steel. And lastly, this ground tissue, here I'll use green. In the leaf, the ground tissue is mesophyll. Again, this is all review from, from lecture four. So I'm just going through it again briefly to remind you. So all this stuff is the mesophyll of the leaf. The ground tissue in the stem is the cortex, which is all this part here. And ground tissue in the root is also the cortex. Right, so that's all review but good to get reminded because it's been a minute since lecture four. We're in lecture 13 right now, which is, wow. Told you the semester goes by really fast. Okay, so growth. Got to talk a little bit about growth. There's two types of growth in plants. There's primary growth, which is what these things here are all examples of. These are tissues that are part of primary growth, right? So. In other words, as the, as the stem gets longer, right, because it's growing, it's going to need to make more xylem and phloem tissue. It's going to need to make more ground tissue and it's going to need to make more dermal tissue because the stem is growing bigger, right? Growing bigger. So, but we have to talk a little bit about primary and secondary growth because we haven't covered this yet. This is new but it's pretty straightforward. So primary growth is what plants, when plants are growing taller or longer, um, that's, that is when primary growth is involved. Um, so you can see here, primary growth is in red and primary growth is too. So this little tree here, right? This little tree on the left needs to get taller. And the way it's gonna get taller is via primary growth. However, there's a limit of how tall you can get without needing to get wider. This little tree on the left can't just forever and ever and ever get longer and longer and longer and longer because eventually it's gonna just uh, snap. If it, if, if it grew 300 feet tall and it never got any wider, it would just break, right? It can't, it can't withstand that uh, height. 
So in order to get taller, even even more taller, it has to also at the same time get wider. And the wider part is the secondary growth. So you see here, secondary growth is to increase the width of the plant body as shown here, right? This tree here has expanded a lot in width. So that's your example of secondary growth. But both things are happening at the same time. I should point that out, right? Like, so just because this tree, just because this tree here is obviously wider, right? It's grown wider. Like, for example, look at the size of that trunk. Look how wide that trunk is compared to this trunk, right? Width. But at the same time, at the tippy tips of the branches, Right, primary growth is still occurring because the branches are getting longer. Um, like here, see this branch here, right? Like at the tip of the branch, you're still going to be having primary growth because it's those might still be lengthening. So both types of growth are happening at the same time, but different tissues and meristems are involved, and that's why we're talking about it today. So all plants have primary growth, period. Write it down, <laughs> make a note. Every plant we've talked about, every plant ever that will ever exist ever does primary growth, all of them. But only some plants have secondary growth and it depends on the type of plant, meaning like the species. So just make a note of that. Not all plants have secondary growth, but all plants have primary growth. All right. What is secondary growth? It's for widening, right? Getting wider. And so instead of an apical, so remember, right? Primary growth had apical meristem, right? Primary growth is by the apical meristem at the tip. But secondary growth is not there. Secondary growth occurs at lateral meristem. Lateral meristems. Lateral meristems. And the names of those lateral meristems are vascular cambium and cork cambium. Those are the two lateral meristems involved in secondary growth. The vascular cambium gives rise to the tissues called secondary xylem and secondary phloem. The cork cambium meristem is gonna give rise to cork, AKA phloem, and phalloderm. We're gonna introduce these terms today, right? But we will use these terms, vascular cambium, cork cambium, secondary xylem, secondary phloem, cork, phalloderm, many, 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 many times going forward. So don't feel overwhelmed. This is just the first time you're hearing it. We're gonna talk about it a lot, but can't learn about it without hearing it for the first time, right? Okay. I like this schematic because it kind of breaks it all down for you of what I had just said. Um, but just so you know, you might think like, well, where do we, how do we even get to like these lateral meristems? And remember I told you, primary growth and secondary growth are happening at the same time. And so what basically ends up happening is eventually these primary tissues, right? The dermal tissue, vascular tissue and ground tissue here, eventually some of these primary tissues are going to actually divide and make those lateral meristems. Don't worry about that too much right now, but I just wanna show you on this schematic here, so these are all the players we've talked about so far, right? Here's the apical meristem. What does the apical meristem give rise to? Primary meristems, protoderm, ground meristem, and procambium. What do those primary meristems give rise to? Primary tissues, epidermis, ground tissue, and vascular tissue. And those will all be involved in lengthening the plant, right? lengthening the stem, lengthening the roots, lengthening. 
eventually you have to start getting wider and that's going to happen with your um, secondary tissues. So see here, remember these lateral meristems we just learned about. So the lateral meristem cork cambium will show up via the cortex. Doesn't, don't worry about that. I don't care that much. I just trying to show you where, what's happening. And the vascular tissue will ultimately, like, so that primary xylem, primary phloem and such will ultimately give rise to the vascular cambium, which is the second, sorry, I did them backwards up here. Cork cambium, vascular cambium, sorry, I did them backwards. Cortex will eventually give rise to cork cambium and the vascular tissues will eventually give rise to the vascular cambium. There, now, I've written, now I did it right. And um, on the previous slide, we said the cork cambium makes these secondary tissues. So cork cambium makes cork and phelloderm. And the vascular cambium, which is this other lateral meristem, makes secondary xylem and secondary phloem. We said that on the previous slide. Um, sometimes in your book or in a lab or online even, depending on what you're looking at, you may see this term periderm. Just know that periderm is a collective term for all of these things here. So the cork, the phelloderm, and the meristem that gives rise to them. I, for whatever reason, it, it does show up and sometimes it causes students to be confused. So I'm just showing you, it's just a collective term for those three tissues. Well, the meristem and the two tissues. Okay. Again, this is all kind of new information, but I'm gonna walk you through kind of transitioning from primary tissues to secondary tissues using these players that we just talked about, okay? And on this slide here, you see cross sections of stems. So these, these circles in the middle are all cross sections through stem. So as the stem is growing, the tip of the stem will have that apical meristem, right? Apical meristem for primary growth. And I'll use the same colors I used before. That apical meristem is going to make the primary meristems, uh, all to do it in the order on the previous. Apical meristem is going to make the primary meristems, protoderm, ground meristem, and procambium, right? Those are the primary meristems. So those primary meristems are going to make those primary tissues that we just talked about. So the Protoderm is going to make the epidermis. The ground meristem is going to make the cortex, pith, etc. And the procambium is going to make your primary xylem and primary phloem, right? So that's what's happening there. Now you don't need to you don't need to know these terms. Just, just trust me in that now stuff's happening meaning primary growth has, has lengthened, but now we need to kind of switch to widening. And so the primary tissues are going to go through some chemical changes. That's all you need to know. You don't need to know those terms on the bottom there. And when that happens, we're going to get those secondary meristems, those lateral meristems, the cork, cambium and the vascular cambium. So here, and I'll switch colors because we just went to secondary here. So look, vascular cambium is the name of the one, one of the lateral meristems that is located right here. And the vascular cambium, which is a meristem, is going to give rise to secondary phloem, which is shown in blue here and secondary xylem, which is shown in red here. So basically the vascular cambium is gonna make secondary xylem towards the inside of the stem 
and the vascular cambium is gonna make secondary phloem toward the outside of the stem. Oh no. My neighbor like parks her car so close to my car. She always hits my car with her door. Oh, I knew she was, that's why I keep looking out there because I knew she was gonna park there. Anyways, it's fine. <laughs> I digress. Um, all right, and then this slide doesn't show cork cambium or anything, right? Because we're still transitioning to a situation where notice in this stem cross section, we have primary and secondary tissues present because we're kind of transitioning from just here, kind of transitioning from just primary tissues, starting to make secondary tissues. So just to use the same colors, right? Look, primary phloem still there, right? Primary xylem still there. Those are primary tissues, cortex and pith. Cortex and pith, those are still primary tissues. Epidermis, that's still primary tissues, but now we have started to get these secondary xylem, secondary phloem and the vascular cambium, which is those secondary things. Okay. Eventually though, now we see here, um, <clears throat> this is now we're, we're going even more towards just secondary tissues, the epidermis, I'll use the red, the epidermis is now starting to get removed, it's ruptured, so it's ultimately the epidermis is going to go away. The cortex, look, it's only to this little spot now, whereas before the cortex, look how much space the cortex took up before, all this beige here in the middle. So we're transitioning here from less to more and more secondary tissues and less and less primary tissues. Um, as I said before, well, it's not shown here on the bottom one, but remember this vascular cambium, and I told you it was right here, right? That line, it still is there, right? Look how much secondary xylem, which is red, has been made. And then the secondary phloem is, is just the little blue area all the way around. Um, and then inside of this periderm, which is the brown part of this disc, is your cork cambium, your uh, cork and your phalloderm, right? The secondary structures. I know this part isn't the funnest, <laughs> but I'm just trying to show you that I'm trying to show you this, that you have primary and secondary going on at the same time in plants that are capable of secondary growth. You start off with just primary growth, but then eventually those primary tissues will start to make <clears throat> secondary tissues. And that's what we watched here. And then by the time you get to E, down here, in e, you have a ruptured epidermis and a little bit of cortex left, but that's it. You don't have any primary xylem anymore. You don't have any primary phloem anymore. You're losing those primary tissues to secondary tissues. And eventually in this trunk, because we're looking at a stem, there will only be secondary tissue eventually. For example, this. So look, this is a trunk that of a, from a cycad that's been cut down. And this trunk only has uh, secondary tissues in it. <clears throat> so we learn about it today in cycads because cycads do have the ability to do secondary growth, but that ability is limited. Cycads don't have a lot of secondary growth structures compared to ginkgo, which we'll learn about next time, and compared to the conifers and some angiosperms, which we'll learn about later in the course. So cycads are, they do have a vascular cambium, but it only produces a little bit of secondary xylem and a little bit of secondary phloem. And cycads do have the cork cambium, but it just, so the take home message is that cycads are capable of secondary growth, right? Because they have the vascular cambium and the cork cambium, but it's limited. 
they don't make a lot of these tissues. Okay. Uh, we also learned about something called the steel in lecture four, and we learned that there's four different types of ways to describe the steel, right? The steel is just a, a term that means how the xylem and phloem are organized. I've said that many times now. If you were to do a cross section through a cycad stem where it's only primary growth occurring, you would have this, uh, it's kind of like, you still like siphonosteel. So it's like a combination of the two of these shown here. I'll use a different color, right? It's kind of like a U steel because you have um, these rods, these little rods of vascular tissue, but it's kind of like a siphono steel because the vascular bundles are in a ring uh, with a central area of pith. So it's a U steel like siphono steel. Remember that? You still like siphono steel, right? <laughs> Same thing. Uh, I'll show you on this slide what it looks like here. So this is a cross section through a young cycad stem. And I'll use the green again. So look, vascular bundle, that's just a word that means xylem and phloem, like bundled together. So here's xylem and phloem bundled together here, here, here's another vascular bundle, et cetera. And notice, I'm not going to put colors on all of them, but they go all the way around the stem, et cetera, in a ring, right? So they are rod shaped in that they are um, kind of like a straw, like many straws, but those straws are all kind of arranged in a ring. You still like siphono steel. Um, Notice the, look, see the outside of the, the trunk has this armor of leaf bases. That was what we talked about before. Girdling leaf trace, I don't really care about that much. Okay, this was a younger cycad stem. If we were to look at the top, comparing stem anatomy in young and older cycad stems, right? So this is a, younger cycad stem. Let's look at an older cycad stem. So the older cycad stem now has a lot more secondary growth than this, which doesn't really have any secondary growth. Meaning we can see some of the secondary growth tissues. So for example, paraderm, which has in it cork, Phelum and cork cambium. We also see these rings of secondary xylem. Anyways, the point is, cycads don't make that much secondary growth, but they are capable of doing it. And we're learning these new terms. And so I'm showing you some of these terms here on these younger versus older stems. All right. I'm gonna pause real quick there and we will pick up here. So how do I forget how to pause? No, hold on. Um, I forget how to do that. Oh yeah, I know how. Okay, so I'm sorry. Uh, more. I'm gonna pause recording. All right, and we should be resumed here with recording. I think we are. I just need to take a, a second there for a minute. It's hard to talk this long. Okay, so let's go back to this. So we just finished kind of talking about the sporophyte, um, some tissues and meristems that are inside the sporophyte plant. Now we're gonna talk a little bit about cycad reproduction. So we're in the seed plants. So obviously we have to have ovules now. Uh, we learned about ovules on Tuesday. And so we know that ovules have different parts of them, right? They have a 
megasporangium. They have inside of that megasporangium one functional megaspore, which went over quite a bit on Tuesday. And those things are both of them inside a integument, right? Which is layers of protection. And then there is a hole at the top of the ovule that is called the micropyle. And that's where sperm is able to enter via the pollen grain, which we'll talk about today. So cycads have ovules. They are gymnosperms. Remember last time, naked seed, right? Naked ovules, naked seed. And so they are gymnosperms. So cycads have ovules that are exposed to the elements, not inside of an ovary like we talked about last time. Um, this is where the female gametophyte plant will, will ultimately be, right? Inside of the ovule. The things that produce uh, microspores are microsporangia like we're used to. So even though ovule is something that's new, and that's where that megasporangium is now located. Microsporangia is still, still called microsporangia, and those are going to be what produces microspores, just like we saw in the other heterosporous species we've looked at so far. Um, the microsporangia on cycads kind of look like a Pac-Man. I don't know if you play Pac-Man, but um, so on this picture here, all those little yellow things uh, are each of them a microsporangium. And so here is one microsporangium kind of looks like a Pac-Man. Um, just like we're used to, we have megasporophylls and microsporophylls. So just because I like to break these words down, remember, phyll means leaf. Sporo refers to sporangia. And so a Megasporophyll is a leaf that has a megasporangium associated with it. A microsporophyll is a fill or a leaf that has microsporangia associated with it. So that's where things are attached. Um, the ovules will be attached to megasporophylls. The microsporangia will be attached to microsporophylls. And so those leaves, so the megasporophylls are sometimes arranged in a strobilis and sometimes not. It depends on the species and I'll show you pictures of what it looks like when it is and when it isn't. Microsporophylls on the other hand are always arranged in a strobilis. So that's handy for us because um, if we think about strobilis, we had a strobilis all the way back in Lycopodium where that was, still homosporous. By the time we get to Selaginella and heterosporous, now we have microsporophylls and megasporophylls that are arranged in astrobilis. Here, microsporophylls are still arranged in astrobilis always, and sometimes the megasporophylls are too. Just in case you forgot what astrobilis is, astrobilis is a thing that has a stem. So here's the stem. It has leaves. In the case of the cycads, the leaves are kind of these, uh, for, and these species here, these little brown things. And sporangia um, attached to the leaves or inside of an ovule attached to a leaf, if you're talking about the female. So here's this here on the left shows two stroboli. So here's one strobilis, here's one strobilis, here's two stroboli. Right, but cycad strobili look really different. Um, so like sometimes they can be different colors and different sizes and different shapes, but we still call them strobili. And they still consist of these things, stem, leaves, and sporangia. And this is what I was just saying. So cycads, their strobili can, depending on the species, they are all different colors, all different shapes, all different sizes. Um, very pretty actually. So this is just to give you an example of some of them. Um, okay, and so you might remember way back when we first started to talk about certain terms, um, we learned these terms monoecious or one house 
and dioecious, which is two houses, right? The house is a plant. <laughs> Um, if you don't remember those terms, go back to the beginning of the semester. But cycads are strictly dioecious, so they have female plants and male plants always. Um, always, always, always. So they are strictly dioecious, and the female plants only have megasporophylls. And on those female plants that have those megasporophylls, they... Um, Depending on the species, the megasporophylls are either going to be arranged in a strobilis. On other species, though, the megasporophylls will be a, what arranged in what's called a crown of fertile leaves. And I'll show you what that looks like. So here are two different plants, right? Two different species of cycad. Both of these are female plants. Because I'm telling you they are, there's no way you can, like, I mean, you can't, never mind. <laughs> Both of these are female plants, take my word for it. On the one on the right, the megasporophylls are arranged in a strobilis. See, here they all are. On the one on the left, the megasporophylls are arranged in a crown of fertile leaves. Here they are in the middle. Um, here is a, instead of just an old weird drawing, right? Here you, is an actual example of it. So here's megasporophylls that are arranged in a strobily. So on the, like I said before, the, on the one on the left here, the megasporophylls don't really look like a leaf. They look kind of like, I always, <laughs> so for this one and this one, because this here is like a, this here is a drawing of, of this one here. But I always think that the, the megasporophylls of this type look kind of like an oyster cracker. I don't know if you ever had those, like the crackers you put in soup. <laughs> um, but yeah, so these little brown things, each of those brown things is a megasporophyll. And on each of those megasporophylls, each of them would have an ovule, which is shown in red here. It's hard to see it in the picture on the left, but they're there. That's why there's, that's why I include this drawing because at least you can see it a little bit. Um, on the picture on the right though, it's a little easier to see. And on this species, the megasporophylls are kind of like red and orange. So here's one megasporophyll, another megasporophyll. And on each megasporophyll will be an ovule, which is red in this species. But this whole thing is a strobilis, this whole thing is a strobilis, this whole thing is a strobilis with megasporophylls on it. Uh, note up here, these are not cones. These are not cones. Sometimes I think the book even, I'm gonna write that book, <laughs> says that these are cones. These are not cones. Cones are in the conifers. These are stroboli, so not cones. So this was an example of megasporophylls arranged in strobily. Because remember, right, megasporophylls sometimes arranged in strobilis, sometimes not, right? So that's what this was showing you too. Here's a species that are arranged in strobily. Here is a different species whose megasporophylls are in this crown of fertile leaves, right? So this here is a crown of fertile, fertile leaves. This here is a crown of fertile leaves. Both of those would be located on the top or the crown of the tree, like so, right, right here. Um, and Whereas these megasporophylls kind of look weird and not like a leaf at all, the ones that are in the crown of fertile leaves look a little bit more like a leaf and not so much like an oyster cracker, right? So like here, look, this looks kind of like a leaf, right? There's another one here, more leaf-like, right? 
to make this crown of fertile leaves here. There's a little fuzzy guys. That's here's one leaf, another leaf here, et cetera. And all of these, all these here are also leaves. Um, but each of those leaves will also have an ovule attached to it. And you can see the ovules here inside with some of those leaves removed. Okay. Yep, this is just so when you're looking at the slides on your own. Um, there's a lot of, so in addition to there being a lot of diversity in the shape, size, and color of the strobily, there's also a lot of diversity in the shape, size, and color of the megasporophylls. So each of these here is a megasporophyll with ovules on it. <coughs> The number of ovules on each one will depend on the species. But like, so this one looks kind of more like a leaf. So that's a megasporophyll that I just drew. This one looks a little bit like kind of maybe a leaf, but more like almost like a blade. That's a megasporophyll I just drew. This megasporophyll here looks kind of like an arrowhead. This one kind of looks like, I don't know, some game piece. Right, this megasporophyll kind of looks like a mushroom. Regardless, each one still has ovules on it. So the three on the right each have two ovules, right? One, two, two, right? These are ovules, I'm not gonna draw all of them. Whereas the species on the left here have um, six ovules per megasporophyll. This one only has five ovules per megasporophyll. So that number of ovules will depend on the species you're talking about. But the reason why I'm drawing these and making a point of this is because like I was saying on the previous, if you're looking at a strobily, megasporophylls on the strobily kind of don't look like leaves at all. They kind of look like oyster crackers or something like that, or these weird red things on the right side picture. Whereas the leaves on the fertile crown, the megasporophylls in the fertile crown kind of look a little bit more leaf-like. And that's what I'm showing you here. So megasporophylls on the left would be those that were part of the fertile crown. So yeah, the blade one doesn't look so leaf-like, but the one next to the blade one looks kind of more like a leaf compared to the ones in the blue box or blue rectangle, right? So those would be examples of megasporophylls that are in a strobilis. Okay, and this is what I was just saying. The number of ovules will depend, the number of ovules per, per megasporophyll will depend on the species of cycad. Okay, I said on the previous that cycads are strictly dioecious. So there are male plants and female plants. This really hit this home. Female plants have only megasporophylls um, for where their sporangia are located. And those megasporophylls will be either arranged in a crown of fertile leaves or on a strobilis, depending on the species. But males are always arranged in a strobilis. So the, the microsporophylls are always gonna be arranged in stroboli on cycads. Um, So one way you could think about it is like, um, right, this is all this, right? Megasporophylls, microsporophylls, cycads are dioecious, female plants, male plants. Female plants have on them a strobilis or a crown of fertile leaves of megasporophylls. Male plants always have strobilis bearing the microsporophylls. Here you go. Here's an example of a male strobilis. Um, here I'll use maybe yellow. So this whole thing is a male strobilis. It is made up of lots and lots and lots and lots of microsporophylls. Lots and lots. If we were to pull, so like this here is a microsporophyll, this here is a microsporophyll, et cetera, here, here, here. Each of these things is microsporophyll. If we were to pull one of those off, 
and look at it up close. That's here on the bottom side or ab axial side, the bottom side of the microsporophylls where all the microsporangia are located. Um, so this is a cross section through a, here I'll do this. If we were to do a cross section through this strobilis or cross section through this strobilis, and then look at the bottom sides of the microsporophylls. So this is a microsporophyll, this is a microsporophyll, this is a microsporophyll. Um, this is the stem of the strobilis. But if you look at the bottom of the microsporophylls, you see all those microsporangia, which on the right picture, it kind of looked like almost fish eggs or something like that. Those are all microsporangia. Okay. Yep, this is just so when you're looking at the slides later on your own. In the cycads, the male gametophyte, so remember that one of the core concepts of plant kingdom course is the reduction of the gametophyte over, over time, right? So we've seen that a little bit in that before, back in the non-vascular plants and stuff, the gametophyte generation was dominant, the gametophyte generation was photosynthetic, it was growing on its own. Then we get to the heterosporous species and now both male and female gametophytes are inside of spores, right? Well, in cycads, the male, the male gametophyte is getting even more reduced than we saw before. So you might remember in Selaginella, it's when we first learned about um, heterosporous plants, right? Selaginella was the first one we learned about where the gametophyte plants live inside of the spore. So remember, when we came across Selaginella, the male gametophyte plant was already reduced to a single antheridium, right? That was inside the microspore. So like this is a microspore, right? It is inside of the microspore. And inside of it is only one antheridium because the male gametophyte plant has already been reduced even by the time we get to Selaginella. Now the male gametophyte plant is gonna be even more reduced. And this is a big evolutionary leap in that we have what's called a pollen grain. So when you get to the seed plants, which is what we're in now, we have the ovules and we have pollen grains. And it's like a big deal. What is, how do we get to a pollen grain? So basically you have those microsporangia, so like these microsporangia, right? The fish egg looking thing. And those are gonna contain cells that are diploid, microsporocytes or microspore cell mo uh, mother cells, whatever you prefer, that undergo meiosis one and two to produce the tetrad of spores. If this is sounding unfamiliar to you, go back to lecture two where you have that schematic of alternation of generations and put it next to you. Um, but yeah, so microspore, um, microspore angia are where meiosis one and two occur inside of on those cells and you get a tetrad of spores. And then those tetrads of spores those tetrads of microspores, let me use purple. So tetrad, remember tetrad just means four, um, but there's gonna be lots and lots of microsporocytes that are all making lots and lots and lots of microspores. So you're gonna have tons and tons and tons of microspores inside that microsporangia. And those microspores are going to undergo, they're going to grow. They're going to undergo mitosis and grow and cytokinesis to produce a very small, highly reduced male gametophyte plant, which is called the pollen grain. And I think because of time, we'll talk about pollen grain and then we'll end for the day. So pollen grain, what is pollen grain? Highly reduced male gametophyte plant, highly reduced male gametophyte plant, even more reduced than single antheridium as we saw in Selaginella. Cycads, the pollen grain has these parts. It has a prothallial cell, which 
we don't really know what prothallial cell does. We just know it's there. We, it's, we, it's like a vestigial, vestigial cell, which means leftover. We think it's leftover from um, prothallus, don't worry about it. But there's a prothallial cell, there's the pollen tube cell, which grows a pollen tube. And then there's a generative cell, which generates two swimming sperm. Um, yeah, I think actually, I think this is probably actually a good place to stop because we've covered quite a bit and it, it'll be a good place to, to kind of, when I pick up on next week on Tuesday, we can kind of backtrack a little bit, and kind of get up to speed. So this is a lot of information. And if you paused a couple times, um, in order to get through this information, you might be getting close to having to go to your next class. So we're going to stop here today. Thank you guys. Um, and we'll pick up here on Tuesday with a little bit of a review to kind of get into it more. So uh, with that, have a good one.